we are a new creation, not bound by the mistakes of the past. Our failures do not dictate our future. There is no mistake that Jesus cannot turn into beauty. He is the brush and we are the paint. With him, our blemishes are washed clean. Freedom is ours through Jesus. Let him be the sculptor and us the clay, carving away our selfish ways. The creator of the earth molding us into a work of art, a one-of-a-kind masterpiece brought to life. In us is unlimited potential that God can use. You were made with marvelous intricacy. You are beautiful and valued. God has orchestrated a tailor-made plan for your life. May a symphony of love and kindness follow you. Reach out to Christ and grab this life. Walk confidently in the knowledge that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. Because God's plan for your life is filled with hope and a future.
So yesterday I had the chance to hang out uh, out at camp. I work out at Camp Myvedon on the other side of Hayden Lake. And Upper Columbia Academy is out there. They've got a group of students that are their student week of prayer speakers. So there's about 20 of them hanging out out there. And they're spending the week talking about, like, what does it mean to be somebody who goes and, for one, speaks, but also someone who worships. And so I got the chance to hang out with them, uh, you know, for about an hour yesterday. And one kid took a good nap during that time, and that's fine. Um, but, uh, but actually, with everyone else, we had this really great conversation on what is worship? Like, we kind of come to church, and we sing songs, and, and we do that because it's what we've always done. But what does it mean to actually engage in worship? And what does it mean to lead worship? And I guess the way that I've always processed that is worship is about creating time and space for us to interact with God. We're not doing anything to, like, manipulate God into coming here or into doing what we want or anything like that. You know, God's here, and it's more about us creating that time and space for God to speak to us. And so, you know, our prep for those of us up here is how do we get to the place where we can do that and not worry about what you think. And your job this morning is to create that same time and space as well. And so I just invite you to do that for the next few minutes as we sing together. Sometimes worship 
is about, sometimes it's about singing, sometimes it's about listening. And I actually, this song I really appreciate because I get to just play my guitar and listen. And uh, it's actually a really nice thing sometimes. And uh, maybe it's nice for the rest of you too, I don't know. But uh, um, yeah, so if, you know, if it's a song you know, sing it. If it's one you don't know, that's okay. Um, sometimes listening is when we create the best time and space to interact with God. I could just sit, I could just sit and wait for all your goodness, hope to feel your presence. I could just stay, I could just stay right where. invite you to stand up for this last one. We don't throw the term opening hymn around here very often, but that's what we're going to do this morning.
Jesus, precious Jesus, all for grace to trust Him more. Heavenly Father, I ask that you help us trust you more. I ask that we go where you lead and we willingly follow. I ask that you bless us today as you, as Costa has said, um, set aside this special day for us. Help us to not just get caught up in all the things we're doing and have to do, um, but just to rest in the simplicity of Sabbath. I ask that you help us make connection with new people or connection with an old friend or family. Um, I think of the families who have suffered loss this last year and we're celebrating um, their lives today with family and I just ask that you pour out a special blessing on them and their family and their travels. Thank you, Lord, for the purity of snow, even we haven't had much this winter, but we're thankful for it. We love you and um, thank you for this time when we can feel your presence here. Amen. Okay, I see friends out here from Sabbath school, and we have a basket up here that's very empty, so I'm hoping that you could go around and see if you can fill it up with some money that will go towards LCA and Palisade School, so if you see all the kids come up and come get the offering, I see some money waving there, don't forget the people in the back. I, I have a funny story about this. Pastor Ron said that I didn't need to say much, but I actually have a funny story. Sierra, oh. when she was three, hi, sis. Mm -hmm. She was three. She was taking up the children's offering, and there wasn't very many kids there. And she came in, and she looked in the basket, and she says, come on, people. We can do better than that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like she hasn't stopped saying that either. <laughs> no, no. Everybody needs a hype girl. Yep, need a hype girl, and... and We've got a few of them around here. But yes, thank you so much. And for, for those of you who are visitors here, yeah, just sit back, relax. Uh, for the regulars, there's some different ways to, to give. And if you're wanting to become a regular and want to start contributing to some of those things, the ministries that we do, there's an app. There's online ways to give. You can do it by mail. Um, you can walk up to Ron. I mean, they, there's a lot of ways yeah. to do it. But, uh, um, but yeah, you know, again, if you're visiting here, we just want you to sit back, relax, and, and enjoy worshiping with us today. Great. And... Uh Talking about uh, family, church family, we get Still to see some uh, in the back. vote somebody into membership today. We got some more kids coming up. Come on, we, yeah, we won't, uh, we won't interrupt the flow. Solid work. We have Zero our priorities. Yep. Um, we get to vote the uh, basket family in officially. Now they've already been uh, involved. I mean, they're part of the family. We don't, we don't do nominating committee here. Do I hear an amen on that? Um, <laughs> So the way to get involved is say, hey, I, I've got a passion. I'd like to do something. And I tell you, the Basket family has just been amazing on that. Uh, Melissa's already involved with our youth upstairs. Uh, Rick's been involved in our AV department training. And Amrail's been training in on that. Kendron, we've got to work on Kendron. But, you know, he's... You know. Well, I, I have to second what Ron is <laughs> saying because I've had a chance to hang out yeah. with, with uh, the Basket family yeah. on some, some service projects and yeah. things like that. Um, yeah, just a lot of fun to have you guys here. I don't know where you're and sitting. They're, they're over here. Over there, over yeah. Here, yeah. A lot of fun having you here. Um, so, and I told Ron this morning that uh, for them especially, they've already fit in so well that yeah. this thing was going to be a slam dunk. Because it's a basket, right? It's just like a I'll switch. sit here and stare at you until you figure it out. I, Jim didn't get it. Three, Jim didn't get it? Three, three point shots. Yeah. Yeah. See, d dad jokes are better if you have to explain them later. Yeah, Those exactly. are actually the best kind. <laughs> Many people don't know that. Exactly. Okay. Um, if, if we're in Portland, we could vote them in with Rip City, but we're no. not. No, we're not. No, no, no we can't no, do that, Ron. So we'll just say uh, welcome. All those in favor of having them join us, say welcome. Welcome. There we are. And uh, good to have you guys. Thanks so much for jumping in on things. We were going to have Kendron come up here and repeat the Ten Commandments, but we'll let, we'll let him off the hook on that one. There we go. Uh, good job. Oh, water damage update. Yes, we are uh, moving forward, engaging a contractor on that. And to let you know, there are several things that we need to get done at this time of needing to be done. You've noticed the parking lot outside that needs to be done. Uh, we're working on the interior roof here, but we also need to extend the exterior roof, replace it. Notice it used to be green. It's not anymore. 
uh, and extend that up over a HVAC gully over in this area. Um, our soundboard is uh, basically a big computer that's seven, eight, nine years old, ten years old. And uh, those of you who know how your seven, eight, nine, ten year old computers are working, um, we've, we've we bought the last five faders. They're the faders that they move up and down been dying. And uh, Noah came to me and he said, uh, two of them are out. Um, there's five more in the world because Roland, who built this machine, one of them, just quit making them. So they don't support them anymore. So there's five more. How many should I buy? I said, buy all five. <laughs> uh, so we're buying that. We're going to make it stretch as long as possible. But we need to upgrade that before we are, are uh, out completely. And you'll also notice there's blank spots on the walls where lights, again, basically computers, six, seven, eight years old, um, are dying, and there are no replacement parts for those. So all told, the things that we need to do with the roof and the parking lot and the AV update, it's going to be about $200,000 is what we need to raise on that. Um, we do have, good news, we do have about $100,000 uh, of that already uh, ready to go. So we're needing support. If you'd like to help support that, the other $100,000 that we need to have done so we can get it done in a timely manner. Uh, the parking lot will include um, across the front and the hole out where you come in. Uh, we've delayed on getting to that one because I think underneath there's a sprinkler line that may be leaking because we patch that thing and it keeps going. So that's going to be a major fix that's adding to some of the cost there. So we're going to need your help and support on that. The interior lobby part is by, by and large is going to be uh, replaced by insurance. Uh, it also took out our internet. That's why live stream has been kind of sketchy. We get it up the next day. Uh, but there will be some residual on that because they always amortize because the old age of the building. So that's some of the 200000 that we need to raise. So uh, this is your first uh, notification on that. Uh, we'll have more information coming out. But just as you do your budgeting and planning, uh, your support towards that uh, will be greatly appreciated. So there we are. Yeah, uh, next week is Jam for Cans. And, and it's interesting this year, partially just because I haven't been around as much, and also just because we weren't even sure what the snow situation was going to be like. Um, w this thing was kind of up in the air, and we weren't totally sure if we were going to able, be able to do it. But we w looks like we're going to be able to make it happen next week. Um, and so there's a lot of excitement in the ski and snowboard community right now about coming and be a part of our event here. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Jam for Cans is a ski and snowboard competition that we put on actually out in our parking lot. And we use it to collect food and to raise money for local food banks. And so next weekend, we'd love for as many of you as possible to come out and be a part of it. Uh, you know, there's one thing, if you're an official volunteer, and we do need those, so talk to me if, if you're interested in helping with some of the things that day. But even if you're not, we just want to be there as a community, and it's a, it's a chance for us to talk with people and rub shoulders with people that we would never, uh, I can guarantee you, have the opportunity to do at other times. So um, it's just a great chance for us to do something positive for our community and also a chance for, yeah, us to uh, to show people what a loving Christian community is like. And, and so um, just want to encourage you to come out for that. So S next week, it's all just going to be set up and ready to go. Yes, sort of. You're working on that. Yeah, right? Ron, Ron uh, I was going to make What's a joke, and it didn't make any sense, so I'm not going yeah, to. No. <laughs> uh, but tomorrow, tomorrow, there's a group that's going to be working to set up everything. And, so that's uh, when it's going to happen. The interesting thing about our setup process, it used to took us like take us like two weeks to do. Now we've got it down to where it actually, we can usually get it done with a good crew in about four hours. So uh, it actually has, has come a long way. So what they're going to be gonna setting that up that? tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. So if there, if there are any of you that want to come and join and help out with that, it's again, great chance to just meet some other people and, and help put this thing together. And what, and kind, of, what kind of skills and tools need to be brought? So usually the, the best thing, you know, a hammer sometimes comes in handy if you need to persuade some things. We do screw most things together. So if you have, uh, you know, a screw gun or, or an uh, impact driver, those types of things are usually the best options. Um, and we do use a few grinders and saws and things. So, w you know, you're welcome to toss a couple of things, bring the whole shop if you want. Some people do. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's a little bit of everything going on. So, uh, and then we just need some muscle, too, sometimes of, of lifting things and moving the them around. I'll be sure and be there. Yeah, I, I know. L Laura, you're going to lift things? You bring yeah. it up. If yeah. they can balance it, you can lift it? 
Okay, good. Yeah, but oh. uh, but I think that's most everything that we that we've got on that. Again, ask me if you have questions, and yeah, we'd love to have you hang out with us next week. Starts at six thirty. And coming up, flourish, exciting this year. Is that me? That's you. Yes, yes. yes. It's my favorite time of year. Okay, so I have to do this every year. Who's been to flourish? Woo! I you actually was there. I worked there. How so come I have no to men are raising their hands? I was there for a short oh, time. Oh wait. <laughs> Yeah, I guess Ron was invited for a little bit. Yes, Flourish is our annual wellness women's retreat, and it's coming up May 17 through 19. This is our fourth year doing it. Wow, wow. Yeah, and the really cool thing about having the same kind of event each year, well, at least for me, getting it going, I was running a little slow this year and wasn't on it, and I keep having all my volunteers calling and being like, hey, hey. when are we going to do that? And that was awesome. So we have all the same instructors coming back. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's out at Camp Myvedon. It is just a retreat for women who, just a kind of chance to regroup and be with other beautiful women in community. There's, um, we have a speaker that we got this year that we're very excited about. Um, some of the leaders and I were reading a devotional book and this, by this woman, and she talks about finding her identity in Christ alone, and she has an amazing story about how that kind of came to be for her. And she's coming, and she's sharing with us, so we're really excited about that. And then, um, yeah. Where's she coming our, from? She Colorado? Yes, Colorado. Colorado? Yeah, Colorado? yeah. and she's awesome. been speaking for 15 years excellent, professionally. Excellent. And, yeah, so that's just amazing. And we have our normal um, art classes and good food that we don't have to cook or clean up. So um, it's on oh, – registration's open now, yep. and it's on our website. And you can do the little Scantron excellent. thing. Yeah, so that's it. Perfect. The best thing, too, is like kids, you and your dads get to eat like macaroni and cheese and ramen all next weekend. So that's something to look Movie forward nights. to as well. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, good morning, church. Good to have you all here with us. And uh, as always, we'd like to welcome our live stream uh, audience. Thank you for being here. And those on Shine 1049, thanks for being a part of our family. Um, just a couple of family notes. Uh, I will be, as soon as I'm done preaching here and disconnect my microphone, I will be leaving. Uh, our sister-in-law, Judy Wesson, many of you know Jerry, Jeff, uh, attend the South Hill Church, but here frequently. Uh, Judy passed away a couple of months ago in her service this afternoon, so we've got to get over um, to that. So if you see me disappear, it's not because I don't like you, um, <laughs> some of you. Um, <laughs> tomorrow afternoon, uh, there's a service for Sam Smith in, at 2 o'clock at the event center in, in the Valley. Sam was our original sound engineer that helped us when we were at the outlet malls in Newman Lake. Um, we are not using any of the equipment that uh, Sam helped us implement. Things have changed, but we're definitely building on the foundation that he laid for us. He's very uh, important to our congregation. So those of you who remember Sam, and I know many of his family members are here, and our hearts and prayers um, go out to you. And uh, thank you for Sam's contribution to our family. Um, but... Um, we love you, and, and, and we love Sam. So that's tomorrow afternoon. Uh, we are on a, a journey of faith this year. Uh, we're starting with the realization that many of us struggle in our faith. Right? Some of us are afraid to admit it. Uh, we struggle in silence. So this is what I want you to do. I'm not asking you to break that silence here, but if you're struggling with faith in God, I want you to admit it. Not to me or to anyone else, admit it to God. In a moment, I'm just going to give you that opportunity to express that. If, I mean, if your faith is strong, tell God, hey, my faith in you is strong. Yay, God, love you. Got your back, you've got mine. If your faith is weak, tell God that. You know, struggling a little bit with that. Uh, if you're struggling whether or not to even have faith in God, uh, tell God that, right? I'm struggling to know whether to believe in you. Um, if, if you're pretty sure God doesn't exist, I, I don't know what to tell you, um, because you could tell him that, but then who'd be listening? Right? 
So do this. If you don't believe that God exists, say it to the universe. I don't think there is a God. I don't believe there is a God. So if you fall somewhere in between that spectrum, tell, tell God that, okay? You got it? That's what I want you to do. So I'm just going to stop talking. Don't say it out loud. God can read your thoughts. Just tell God how you feel about him right now. Now, I'm going to assume that in an audience this size, filled with people who are in church, and we don't want to lie in church, especially not to God, I'm going to assume somebody who's honest enough to tell God, tell the universe, I don't believe in you. I don't think you really exist. Others undoubtedly told God that they were struggling with believing in him. And guess what? Nobody got hit by lightning. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what happens when you let the AV people turn loose, you know? <laughs> but all kidding aside, nobody got hit by lightning. Right? You can tell God you don't believe in him and he doesn't get mad at you. Today, we want to talk about believing in God when you're not sure you want to believe. And today, we're going to talk about sin. Do I hear an amen? <laughs> we love to talk about sin, don't we? I mean, if I had a dollar for every time someone said, Pastor, let's talk about sin more. I couldn't afford Starbucks. <laughs> we really don't like to talk about sin. We don't like it. We used to talk about it. Preachers used to talk about it a lot more than they do now, years ago. Um, growing up, it seemed like every sermon I went to included verses like, for the wages of sin is death. For all of sin fall short of the glory of God. Whoever commits sin transgresses the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Whoever commits sin transgresses also the law. If anyone then knows the God, the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. And I'll be honest, I've developed a bit of cynicism to the word sin. I don't like it. I don't like to preach about it. Sermons about sin have turned God into a vindictive policeman or a surly teacher, you know, just waiting for me to break the speed limit or some classroom rule. Right? It's like God had speed traps everywhere with angels manning radar guns just trying to catch me at some infraction. Slight deviation off the middle of the road because there is danger on both sides, so stay down the middle of the road. Punishment intentionally swift if we stray even a little bit. As I mentioned, I don't like sermons on sin. Philip Yancey uh, sort of describes my view and experience along with his quite accurately. He says, I envision God as a frowning enforcer rather than a loving creator who desires the best for us in life with sin as the main obstacle preventing it. I missed any sense of sin as a negative marker pointing towards life as it is meant to be. It, too, a telling point to another world. See, a misunderstanding of sin is so tur has turned so many people away from the church, from God, from faith. Pastors and churches rarely are portrayed positive light in any TV shows or movies, right? Seems that there are so many who react against the hypocrisy and the stern judgment that the church and its leaders practice with far less grace than would the God they profess to represent. There's a backlash against God and the church in much of art, TV, movies, social media. And it isn't just something new from this generation. John Muir, father of national parks, he actually fled Scotland because of the harshness of his father who scorned his interest in nature as something that was frivolous and ungodly. George Orwell lost his faith in a boarding school 
where staff members would beat him and condemn him as a sinner every time he wet the bed. I myself spent enough years in boarding school as a student and as a teacher. I could go on for quite some time about the ridiculous connections made between dress code compliance and suitability for salvation. As a pastor, I've encountered many people who've been harmed for eternity because they've been either kicked out of a church or have been denied access forbidden access to a church for weddings or funerals because of some perceived level of sin. And honestly, I don't know one of those banished people who has ever come to me and said, you know, it was really a good thing they did. I'm so much better off for it and feel much better about God. I don't like sermons on sin. I really don't like the word much itself. Things have changed over the years. We hear less and less about Sin. Almost nobody speaks of this. Try this sometime when you're in a discussion with someone about the increase of sexually transmitted diseases or drug use or crime or social injustice or, in fact, anytime you're in a discussion with anything, with anybody about anything that's being reported as news these days, just insert the word sin into the congregation, into the conversation. See what kind of response you get. Nobody sins anymore. Remember Richard Nixon? How many remember Richard Nixon? The old people. <laughs> He's caught net red hand. He never sinned. Mistakes were made. Right? Bill Clinton. Depends what the definition of is is. Right? We don't sin. We have poor judgment. We make mistakes. We're addicted. It was inappropriate behavior. We regret the actions we took. Nobody sins. In this sermon series, we're looking for reasons to believe in God. And some suggest because there is so much sin, it's evidence that there is no God. It disproves God, but I'm not sure that sin or mistakes or addictions or moral failings disprove God. In fact, the existence of sin might actually prove the existence of God, but perhaps not in the way you might think. For us as Christians, it is quite easy to believe that rejection of God leads to moral decay. In fact, I doubt you'll find any Christians or Jews or Muslims for that matter who find that difficult to believe. However, I rather suspect that for those who aren't already believers in God, that's not a natural causal relationship. If you don't believe in God, and presumably there are some here, who've already admitted to the universe. How does sin prove the existence of God? We, we talk of morality, oughtness, a sense of obligation. We ought to be good people, treat each other fairly. Where, where does that sense of oughtness come from? Well, presumably, we are taught by our parents, caregivers, guardians, teachers, others who are role models for us. Our mothers tell us that we ought to clean up after ourselves if we spill milk. Eventually, we see the value in, our, in it ourselves. Perhaps we teach that oughtness to our kids. But where does that oughtness come from? And how does it provide proof for God? We're taught we ought to obey our parents. But why should we obey our parents rather than the nice man who drives by offering us candy? Why should we clean up a mess when I don't really have a particular appreciation for neatness? The obvious answers are that there are safety concerns, societal concerns, neighbors will like you better if your yard is neat, etc., Every once in a while, I'll, I'll read articles by someone who claims to be an authority in etiquette. Sometimes I decide, I don't care if I please some of those people. Here's the deal with some of the ideas about oughtness. When we profess a preference for an oughtness, we are really acknowledging its opposite. I'll give you an example. 
Let's say I don't believe in being neat. I'm really affirming the idea of neatness. If I don't believe in neatness for myself, I'm still affirming that there is such a concept as neatness. John M. Frame in his book, Christianity Considered, says this, how can the knowledge, or he asks this question, how can the knowledge of an enemy become knowledge of a friend? At first, it seems absurd, but it starts to open the window into understanding a concept which may have trouble believing. If we know the kind of people we don't like, it gives us some idea of the kind of people we do like. For instance, if someone steals a woman's purse, beats her up, instinctively we know we don't want that kind of person for a friend. We know he has done something wrong. And it's not just a feeling like something is wrong, like milk is being spilt. There is seriously something wrong. Most of us Christians or otherwise might actually attach moral judgment on this action. It is morally wrong to steal purses and to beat up women or anybody for that matter. But where does that moral judgment come from? Some suggest moral judgments are kind of like physical laws. They're just, they're there. What goes up must come down. But, but that isn't the same as moral oughtness. If I throw a ball into the air, it will come down. There's no option, no oughtness to it. The ball isn't contemplating the existential question posed by those renowned philosophers, the clash, should I stay or should I go? There's no oughtness. The ball will fall. No morality involved. Social scientists tell us that in every culture there are moral oughtnesses. I think I may have made that word up. They're actually very similar across most cultures. We learn these oughtnesses regardless of our culture or our heritage from parents, teachers, pastors, coaches, social commentators, podcasters. And when oughtness conflict how do we determine which ones to adopt and which ones to let go? That's not always easy, and the answer is very personal. Our decisions regarding oughtness really comes down to loyalty and love. Whom do I love more? To whom do I feel the most loyal? Those I love, I am loyal to. They help those that I love and am loyal to help determine which set of oughts I adopt. But love and loyalty in themselves aren't enough. If someone you love betrays you, becomes brutal, cruel, abusive, perhaps even murderous, and unfortunately happens all too often, what then? John Them says makes this observation. When this happens, we realize that the source of morality is greater than our family, our clan, even our church, greater than our present loyalty, but not greater than loyalty itself. Morality is grounded in a higher loyalty and a higher love. It is grounded in a greater family, headed by someone who can never become a monster. If there is morality, if there is oughtness, if there is morality... It comes from something bigger than us. Something that we can love and be loyal to. And if there's an oughtness to our actions, there's also an oughtness to our beliefs. For instance, if someone believes that people are inferior because of the color of their skin, we don't hesitate to say their belief is wrong. In fact, it's morally wrong. They ought not to believe that. And if they ought not to believe the false belief, then they ought to believe the opposite belief. And not that every belief becomes a moral issue or not believing every belief is a moral transgression. You know, we don't expect our kids, four years old, to believe that the moon circumnavigates the 
world every 29 a few days, a few hours, days, or 29 days and a few hours. We aren't talking about that. But what we universally recognize, whether or not we recognize it, is that there are actions and there are beliefs that have moral implications. And acting or believing in immoral ways, and we can give it any name we want, but it really boils down to three letters that we don't like to talk about, that perhaps we're cynical about. Sin. But how does this prove God? I think we've made a mistake in the religious world in making everything about us. We've talked about this before. Believe it or not, the Bible is not about us. It's about God. The Ten Commandments are likewise not about us. They're about God. They're about sin, yes, but they're about God. Let's take a look at just some of the thou shalt nots in the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not kill. What does that tell us? Is this primarily a prescription for us as human beings? Maybe. But consider this. Every culture in the world has the same injunction. Don't kill. This is not something new. Why did God put this in the Ten Commandments? They, they already knew that. Go back to the Genesis 4. They knew killing is wrong. Forbidden by God. So why, with the precious little real estate that God had on his two tablets of stone, why include this that was already universally accepted? Even the indigenous tribes of Canaan had these already, this already in their laws. We've unearthed some of those tribes that predate Moses' writing. So why? Well, because it isn't about us. This is about God. God doesn't kill. We spent quite a bit of time on this last year. Ancient Hebrews struggled with this concept. They thought their God was just like all the other tribal gods out there. Fickle, arbitrary, punishing. God says, don't kill. It's a sin. God does not kill. We don't want to hang around people who kill. Unfortunately, today, many people still do not understand this thing about God. If you don't accept God as a loving God, he's going to kill you. Or he may torture you in hell for all eternity. Which is actually worse than just out and out killing somebody. And I don't get it. We will give our love and loyalty to those who don't kill. Ten Commandments is about God. God does not kill. Sin kills. God says... If you understand how wrong it is, killing, do the opposite. You'll get a glimpse of who I am. God says, don't commit adultery. Again, why did he have to include this in the Ten Commandments? Everybody knows it's going to lead to hurt. They've had thousands of years experience that already. Even Hollywood, New York, the great endorsers of promiscuity and unfaithfulness. They know. What are the major stories on page six of the New York Post? For those uninformed, page six is the gossip column of the New York Post. What's standard fodder? Who's been unfaithful to whom? Who's splitting up? Why are they splitting up? What's the pain? What's the fallout? So why is this included in the Ten Commandments? It's sin. But what's the message? Be faithful. And again, this is more about God than it is about us. God is saying to us, there is faithfulness. I am faithfulness. God says, don't steal. But again, why is that included in the Ten Commandments? Every single set of laws, the tribes, the ancient Canaan, and since then, have included this along with numerous other laws explaining, defining, clarifying what it all means and how to punish it. So why put it in the Ten Commandments? Well, what's its opposite? 
Be generous. God says, I'm not a stingy God. I'm a generous God. I'm not going to take from you. I'm going to give. You don't provide the sacrifice. I provide the sacrifice. See, you can trust this God because he is a generous God. God says, don't, thou shalt not bear false witness. Again, same question, why? This wasn't a new concept, something no other nations had ever thought about. Again, this is about God. The other gods were liars. You read the ancient mythologies, and the gods basically brag about how they lie and cheat to get ahead, to get one up on, to deceive, to better any of the other gods or humans. Ancient gods are proud of the fact that they could deceive and cheat to get the upper hand. But not this God. This God doesn't bear false witness. This God doesn't lie. This God is tr truthful. You can trust this God. God says, don't covet. This one's a little bit trickier because I'm not sure the other nations included much in this regard. But again... It's really about God more than it is about us. See, God's not naive. He knows that it is impossible for us not to covet. Lucifer couldn't resist it. Adam and Eve couldn't resist it. For thousands of years, people were not able to resist coveting before the Ten Commandments were given. And by the way, how are you guys doing with that? Anybody not covet within the last 24 hours? A couple hours ago, I drove through the parking lot. I failed. Some really nice cars out there. See, this is about God, not about us. God isn't fickle. He doesn't look at his kids and say, hmm, I wonder if there are better ones for me to love. I wonder if I can get others who are more faithful. No, this God doesn't covet. Now, a legitimate question is, how do we know this isn't about us and this is about God? I don't, I don't want to go over this again. The last sermon of 2023, if you missed it, check out our YouTube channel, Summer Northwest live stream, December 30, uh, 2023, in case you missed that last sermon. But here's that sermon in a nutshell. Nobody has been successful Nobody. Didn't matter if they had a perfect environment with no sin anywhere around them. Lucifer failed. He sinned. It didn't matter if there was sin around, but your church, I mean, your garden was perfect and there was no sin and everything was perfect in your church, I mean, your garden. Adam and Eve sinned. Paul was right in Romans 23 and he said, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. A summary statement of the Old Testament right there. And the New Testament. And all of recorded history. So back to our original question regarding faith in God and sin. How does sin prove the existence of God? Universally, cultures agree. Don't kill, don't cheat, don't steal, don't lie, don't even want to. Which means we have universally affirmed the idea of protecting life, being honest, respecting other people's things, not cheating. In fact, we ought to do these things. We have this ideal. There is a universal oughtness to obeying the vast majority of the Ten Commandments, even if we don't recognize it as such. And yet, nobody does it. It is humanly impossible. It cannot be done. It ought to be done, but nobody could do it. There is no recorded history of anyone successfully accomplishing the oughtness that cultures believe ought to exist. Universally, we believe that there should be ultimate good, ultimate faithfulness, ultimate safety, honesty, ultimate love, and somebody or something that is worthy of our ultimate loyalty. We believe it should be there. And if that is your belief, then you have just admitted a belief in God. Ultimate safety. Ultimate honesty, ultimate loyalty, ultimate love. Not humanly possible. 
but with God it's possible. Now, does that mean it doesn't matter to us? We can go out and kill and lie and steal and cheat and commit adultery? No. Don't be dumb about this. That's why there's this oughtness throughout all cultures. Don't do it. What I'm saying is, those things, if you're not sure you believe in God, consider what those things, those oughts, are telling us. So I don't know where you're at this morning. Maybe you're having a hard time struggling with your faith in God. Maybe, you, like me, you're cynical about sin, but you believe there ought to indeed be someone or something too complex to describe or to put into words, a being who's worthy of our love and loyalty because he's ultimately completely trustworthy, honest, loving, and loyal. Some of us can call that completely loving, trustworthy being God. And best of all, and I know you know that I can't get through a sermon without saying it, this completely loving, honest, safe being, completely worthy of our loyalty. He's crazy about you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for being that amazing God. And when at times we can't feel like we can trust, we know that there ought to be something about better beyond ourselves we have a belief in some ultimate good and you are that ultimate good and we thank you for being trustworthy loving and worthy of our loyalty and we're crazy about you too amen god bless you have a great day god loves you